to quickly bring in the next moderator of the second panel. And that panel is about vision, foresight, re rebuilding a new Nigeria. Panelists include Professor Samo Yobare, Elijah Amadu Abubakar, Professor Adele Jinadu, Senator David Mack, Her Excellency Elijah Senator Ojikutu, and of course, Colonel Olagunsoye Oyinlola retired. But before I bring them in, I need to bring in the one and only Uncle Chidi, as I call him, journalist extraordinaire, and I would like to please bring him in now as the, comp as the moderator of the next panel. Please put your hand together for Dr. Chidi Amuta. By way of general remarks, we are dealing with a great historical personality, almost a personage, somebody who has become an icon, who has become a personage of pilgrimage. Whether you are a politician, you need to pay homage to IPP. If you are a businessman, you need to pay homage. If you are an intellectual, and for me, as an individual, the central appeal of IBB is that of, and I have encountered a number of leaders, not just in Nigeria, but elsewhere in the world. He is one leader who I, whom I have found intellectually engaging. Somebody who has aroused intellectual curiosity. Why did he do what he had to do? And talking about the issue of his vision, his mission, you cannot talk about a vision if you don't even have an understanding of where the leader was standing. I mean, it is easy, relatively easy to be a leader to do the usual things. What, what I call you, you can be a president of yes, ordinary things. Yes. But for you to be a leader that excites the curiosity of your countrymen, it means that you want to take your nation from a point to another point. To illustrate this, it's been 28 years since President Babangida left office. Today, as we prepare for the 2023 elections, there are effectively two parties. The contest is between the APC and the PDP. But 28 years ago, somebody had the foresight, the vision, to summarize the Nigerian political equation, to say, at the end of the day, we will always end with two parties. Today, most of the people in this room are engaged in the business of running their own businesses, running their own lives. 28 years ago, the business of Nigeria was run by the government, essentially. Everything was a national institution. If you wanted to import, if you wanted shipping, if you wanted to fly in Nigeria, you had to go to Nigeria Airways. Today, 28 years after, you get to the airport, for as long as you have your money, you can catch a flight in a private airline. 28 years ago, that is not working there. Somebody envisioned it. So you, you need, in order to understand the vision, you need to go back in time to that point at which the, some decisions were made. And therefore, I want us on this panel to deal with aspects of that vision that has brought the nation to where it is today. There may have been deformations, misalignments by subsequent regimes, but I mean, your responsibility for that is for those who took on these jobs, not for the original visionary. Therefore, there are three areas of the vision and mission that I would like us to look at. First, uh, there will be another panel on the economy, but the economy, for somebody to wake up 
and decide along with his team that Nigeria needed to move away from being a central, centrally planned economy to a free market economy is a significant step. That is one aspect of the vision. For somebody to wake up and say, OK, although we are a democracy, but we needed to organize this democracy in such a way that there is greater freedom, but there is also order, and have two political parties, so that the question of choice is easier for our people. And if you look at all the major democracies of the world, at the end of the day, they gravitate around two major political parties. If you're an American, you're either a Democrat or, or you're a Republican. You can be anything else that you like, but you're not going to win. If you are in England, you are either a Tory or Labour. You can be something else by attaching yourself to one of the main ones. So essentially, 28 years ago, somebody saw that. The third aspect is the society. Somebody looked at the society and said, well, we are going to have free enterprise, which is going to produce a lot of rich people. But in the process, we're also going to have a lot of poor people. What do we do to mitigate what kind of society? Maybe we need to have, instead of a society where some things are free or is controlled by the rich, let's have a fair society. And somebody came up with institutions for poverty alleviation, institutions for rural empowerment, institutions for gender empowerment, and so on and so forth. So these are the three major aspects of the IBB vision, that I would um, urge members of this panel to address um, in no particular order. And of course, this also went with a lot of institution building. And people have made references to certain institutions that we have today, whether it is the Nigeria Deposit Insurance, NAFDAQ, NDLEA, the three arms of the security, the organization of the military, building of modern barracks, name it. The major institutions that govern our lives today were instituted by the IBB administration. So I would like us to deal with this. And this visioning didn't concentrate on any one aspect. IBB realized that we have a nation that is a diversity. We have all kinds of people. The management of diversity is the central problem we are having up till now. But he, he didn't have a problem with diversity. Every Nigerian was welcome because the best in all of us was summoned to national duty. Whether you were a soldier or a market woman, you had a right to participate in discussion, in debates about how the nation was going to be run. Women in the marketplaces debated IMF, and some of the most bright views came from those women. People in the barber's shop debated the political bureau and how many parties we should have. That inclusiveness is what we are talking about in building a multi-ethnic society. So I would like to start with uh, Senator David Mann, what was IBB's vision for the military, an institution to which you owe most of your career, even though you became a politician later on? But I served under General Babangida and President Babangida in three different capacities. First, as a governor of Niger State. That was under General Babangida because he was chief of minister of then. For the avoidance of doubt, a military posting as a governor is purely a military posting. The person in charge is the chief of army staff, not, not the head of state and not the chief of staff spring quarters. General Babangida was the chief of army staff when I was posted to Niger State as a governor. And then I became a member of the Armed Forces Ruling Council when he became the president, and also a minister of communication when he became president. That's why I said in three different capacities under 
General Babangida and President Babangida. I listened to all that was said there this morning about his kindness, his, his human endeavor, his approach to the way he related with people. General Babangida knew those of us, at least in the army, just as much as our parents. He would wonderfully phone you one day and remind you of your wife's birthday. And most of us would just forget. He knew the names of our children. He knew what our interests were. He knew who my friends were. I'll just give you a very short story. When he was chief of army staff, he visited me in Niger State. And I was taking him back. I, he was driving in my car. I had a driver called Kekere, who used to dress in Baban Riga three piece, and I would dress in shirt and trousers. So when we get to a function, he will come out very quickly and be hovering around, you know, being the big man. And people will go to him and say, are you David Mark? The, then he will reluctantly say, no, he's not the one. So Kekere was driving us back to the hilltop. And he asked me, he said, sir, uh, did you say you are going to put my name in the names of those to be retired very soon? That's the driver asking me. And Babangida was in the car with me. I said, yes. He said, sir, have I committed any serious offense or is it the small, small lies that I tell? <laughs> you know? And General <laughs> Babangida couldn't stop laughing. So. I told him, Kekere, shut up. He said, yes, sir. But Bangida had the story. We dropped the general, and then we got back. And next day, General Babangida phoned me and said, Oga oh David, don't retire Kekere. <laughs> so I said, OK. I will not put his name among those to be retired. As a president, and when I went to Niger State, by the way, Niger State at that time had the largest number of generals in the army. General Abdul Salami, General Vasa, General Duba, General Kontogura, uh, Air Marshal Isa Doko, um, and the host of them. So they were pulling me left, right, forward, and back. This general will phone you about one person, another general will phone you about the same person, both of them going in opposite directions. But General Babangida stood by me. He will always say, whatever decision you take, it is the final. Don't mind the other generals. Although I had friends amongst them, closer friends, who were defending me from time to time. But the point I'm trying to make is, once he gave you an appointment, he allowed you to take the decisions and take responsibilities for your decisions. When I became Minister of Communications, I went to him one day and I said, look, Nitel is going to die unless we do something drastic. People were owing so much. Government officials were not paying their bills. Nitel was being subsidized by government every month, giving a certain amount of money to be able to pay salary. And I found that very strange for a telecommunication company, the only one that had monopoly. So I went to him and said, sir, the way Nitel is going, it will die. But I want government officials to pay their telephone bills and on time. And I want to start with Dodan Barracks. He said, ah, Dodan Barracks. I said, yes, sir. He said, OK. I, I brought the bill and I said, can I? give you one week. He said, no, we can pay it within a few hours. So I said, OK, if you don't pay tomorrow, I will cut off all the lines leading to Dodan Barracks. Of course, I did cut the line. And people went to him and said, you trust David Mark? He wants to conduct a coup, and he's cutting Dodan Barracks lines. And he didn't say a word. He was just looking. Thank God, you know, Salami was there. So he went to him and said, this boy will not do a coup without telling me. It's not a coup. <laughs> so they paid their bill. And of course, immediately after that, other departments started paying bill. 
And he told me, after all, he said, look, let NITEL function, let NITEL fund herself. Let NITEL not depend on government to collect money to pay salary. And by the time I was leaving the ministry after 18 months, NITEL did not only fund herself, NITEL was able to build two earth, station, earth stations from internally generated revenue by government officials paying the base which they were owing. Babangida established so many organizations, as you heard in the morning here, so many bodies, so many institutions. Those were all visions that moved this country forward. Federal Road Safety uh, Corps. Today we enjoy a Federal Road Safety Corps. Raw Materials Research Institute, uh, NDLEA, as you heard also the intelligence communities. So he had a lot of vision for this country. And how did he achieve this? He had a formidable team, formidable, real formidable team. He had intellectuals and practitioners. He had strategists and, tech and tacticians. And he had, in the military, we call staff officers and operational officers. And he was able to bring them together. If you attended any meeting with him, you know he allowed people with extreme views to express themselves. And he allowed the moderates to express themselves. But what baffled me most he was how he was able to pick all these people and put them together. And not only that, but in the course of the discussions, he was able to moderate to get the best out of them. So there are a lot of institutions that he established, and he wanted these institutions to grow, even to make sure that the democratic system was OK and was all right. And like you rightly pointed out, he established, he insisted that there should be two main democratic parties, the uh, National Democratic Party and the uh, SDP and the NRC. Um, and, and if people, there was a lot of pressure on him to get more than that, but he insisted, for those who were close to him, we knew that he insisted that at best there will be only be two parties. That vision is still on today, and like you rightly pointed out, any other third party in the country today is, well, just come and let us do. But not that they were going to win, and they don't have a chance at all. Outside the military, my good friend there sitting down there, always quiet. <laughs> Ambassador Dr. Tunja Lagujo was there. And we, and we did some work before even he took over. The way he took over was miraculous. I said, this is not a place of personal testimonies. Because if the coup had failed and the successors of that failure had traced back. Even the statement read by Duguyaru and by Abacha before he, IBB, made the pronouncement from Bonnie Camp. These were things that uh, require personal testimonies. But I'm not going to go into that because we are in a session and I thought we should keep within that session. It is not by accident that so many people, including <coughs> Dr. Shidi Amuta himself, <coughs> author of various books about Babangida, about Babangida. But there are four, if you call them books, I just want to refer to. The first was what is very small, a 120 page book. We call Foundations of a New Nigeria. Ambassador, Professor, Honorable Minister Tunde Adenero took part in that. He also took part. We got it together. But they were not written, the, the chapters were not given the authors. Foundations of a New Nigeria. And secondly, the very first set of major speeches crafted and read by him, indicated his vision. And two of us put it together and we call it Portrait 
of a new Nigeria. And then the third book, which is the second volume of a species, was titled, For Their Tomorrow We Gave Our Today. And finally, the set of species which examined the huge crisis the country was getting through was titled Crisis of Democratization. Now, when, when you put these four books together, you will know the vision of the man. I will summarize by saying, the two planks of his vision, there's a third one, but the two major planks were democratization of the Nigerian polity and society. And secondly, liberalization of the Nigerian economy. Yeah, it is with us, <laughs> but for IBBA, it will not. I had the privilege of giving the radio station the license before the television section came up. And, and so the, the man had a background, and I dare say, as a close scholar of the man, that he envisioned all of that, partly from, I believe, his upbringing, because uh, we, we did about eight chapters of an unfinished manuscript unfinished because he wasn't willing to finish it. But his life, his background, and perhaps particularly the pioneer participation in NIPS number one, 1979-1980. All of that constituted what the man was. I'm glad that Chief Iwayan was here. He made a, a statement recently on Arise Television. If you want to govern this country, you should know this country. You should know this country. Do you know today we are talking about six zones, so to say, south, south, southeast, southwest, north central, northeast, northwest. Do you have friends in these places? Do you know people who know people, who know the society? And it's very important to know this country. It's a very complex society. Do you know their beliefs? Do you know their systems? I'm glad General Mark, Senator David Mark, had just talked about his experience and his driver. My traditional ruler, one of the smallest, one of the traditional, one of the smallest society or ethnic Sub, it's actually a sub-ethnic nationality. We are within the robo sector. We are open. IBB showed up at the barrier of the monarch. And finally, we succeeded in putting his former student, who is a general in his own right, General Felix Mujakbero, as the traditional ruler of my place today. And he was involved. I wouldn't go into those personal testimonies. But back to what I was saying, democratization was so fundamental to IBB's program. You democratize the polity, political process. You democratize even the society itself. Implementing them was a serious problem. I tell you a story, a little bit of a little story, that we were very concerned. There was a 17-member political bureau, and I happen to have participated. Uh, Ambassador Tundi Adenino is there, okay. And um, we ended up by making one of the many recommendations, very, very small but very important recommendation, namely, you want to retain traditional rulers in this country, then don't spend a cobble, don't spend a cobble of government money on them. Let those communities who want their traditional rulers to take care of them. And of course, 
then I don't know if you know that the General Omu uh, Committee, Paul Omu's committee that looked at the political bureau's report, also recommended it. And of course, at the end of the day, um, okay, at the end of the day, accepted that yes, this should be done. But very many years to come, Babagira never implemented it. So each time I joke with him, what about that recommendation not to give a cover of the Nigerian state to traditional rulers? He said, you want to kill me? Very interesting. But what I'm saying is that democratizing the Nigerian society and democratizing the political process was such a serious, it goes to so many angles. Then um, there's going to be a panel later liberalization of the economy, which, as I said, and communication and all the rest of them. Those days, directors retire from NTA, and they don't do anything anymore. This very productive Nollywood, is it Nollywood or Hollywood, which do you call them? The Nigerian society today, this Nollywood, was founded by Pabangida. This huge industry today, because you had People who were retired from NTA, they had no more anything but to sit back and looking out for their pension. I just happen to have been privileged to be nearby when all this happened. So, vision was something in beauty in that man. And he has a rare gift of knowing people. Not just knowing people, knowing them by their first names. Wonderful. It makes you feel human. 17 of us were inaugurated in this Abuja. Abuja was it as beautiful as this then. In the political bureau, two ladies, Mrs. Hilda Adifarasi, another lady who was a lecturer at the University of Lagos, now late, blessed memory. After the inauguration, he came down, and Dr. Tunjo Laguju, before he became an ambassador, was behind all of that. He came down and greeted every one of the 17 of us by our first names. First names. You, you feel that sense of somebody who was close to you. So finally, as a short, I, I just want to say that if you're looking at vision about how this country is, you just have to know this country. You just have to move. Whether it's the two-party system, whether it's the economy and society and so on. And all of this, by the way, is, was complemented by Her Excellency, we are so rest in peace, Mrs. Miriam Babangida, who also took the challenge that you must carry change to the grassroots. I thank God that um, God gave uh, President Babangida good offspring and uh, good followership that this forum is coming to life today. May God continue to bless all those who, who, who brought it to being and bless all of us who are here. Uh, my, my journey with uh, President Babangida did not start with the uh, deputy governorship. Um, you've uh, mentioned Dr. Lagunju here today. Um, I always say this, a vision, when a man has a vision, and when God has given you a vision, it starts from not, you know, is not um, midwived in the air. President Babangida started his vision from the choice of his partner in life. Bringing Mariam into his life was the first vision he has of being somebody in life. Because look at homes, any home that you have that is settled, any man that you have that is successful out there, has a strong woman behind him. And Babang uh, President Babangida is lucky to have chosen Lady Mariam, Her Excellency Mariam Babangida, as a wife. He, he must have seen some qualities in her that you know, made him to choose her. And she has been a moving force. She was a moving force in his life. And we women, 
we are beneficiary, we are beneficiaries of that moving force. So when I mentioned Dr. Olagunju, I was a public officer. I was serving, in, in actual fact, I was serving in Lagos State as the controller of estates. I had dealings with, uh, you know, men of timber and caliber, because land is like oil in Lagos State. And I was given the assignment by His Excellency, God bless his soul, Alaji Latif Kayo de Jakonde, to produce certificates of occupancy. Producing certificates of occupancy in Lagos State was like minting gold, because you'll be bribed, and uh, people will give you all sorts of uh, enhancement to produce it. And I was put there, and I refused to be enhanced and all that. But I was t turning out certificates of occupancy, like turning out, you know, peanuts. But it didn't go well with many people, because it was their gold mine. And here comes this woman who refused to be bribed, who refused to get anything. All she's interested in was how many CFOs will come out. Because that was the target of the then governor, the action governor. And that is where he was able to make the money that he used to build Lagos, or the infrastructures in Lagos. We had to uh, produce CFO for people to uh, get their title in order to get money from the banks, in order to pay, you know, Lagos State is due. So I, st I got tired of all the blackmail, everything that was going on in that office. And I produced my CV. And when soldiers, when they come, you know, they have to get land and all that, many people, <laughs> bankers. So instead, when they say, what do you give me? Well, what can I give you? You've been so good, you didn't ask for anything and uh, you are just working. I said, look, I'm tired of this office. I want to move. I came from the banking world into the civil service. I want to go back into the private sector and all that. So I produced myself. When they say, where do I'm looking for a job. So I just give my, my CV. I'm looking for work. How my CV got to the presidency, I don't know till today. The only thing I knew you know, I know I was qualified to be in the banking sector, having come from Central Bank, having worked in National Bank, you know. The next thing is announcement that I was made the executive director. But Bangida Steno has a way of making firsts. And among women, he made a lot of firsts for us to be in position. And we thank God for him. So I was the first female to be made executive director in any bank in Nigeria. And I didn't know, <laughs> thank you. And I didn't know anybody. I didn't have to go and lobby. I didn't have to go and. So the first time I met, uh, you know, I had touch with the presidency, I was summoned that um, I was doing, uh, you know, there was a bid for a, a project that has gone bad. And that um, somebody wanted to do that project, and I knew he was not qualified to do the project. So I, I stood my ground, and it got to the presidency, and they went to blackmail me that I was tribalistic, that I wanted to give it to a Yoruba man when an Aouza man wanted the project. So this firing squad, I was called to the presidency to come and defend myself. Lo and behold, the panel that met me, Dr. Laguju and others were there, and I presented my case. The project is still on in Lagos State. And they said, okay, if that's the case, go on. My point is, if President Babangida is not a man of vision, to have able lieutenants, Nigeria's problem today has to do with a lot, a lot of things that lieutenants are doing that are not good, and they are putting their principles in, a, in bad light. President Babangida was lucky to have good lieutenants as soldiers and as civilians. He, was a, he, he is a very, very lucky man, 
And it's because he also has the, he has the knowledge and the, the grace of God to be able to choose and relate to people. That's my first encounter with them. Then come the political one. President Babangida started experimenting with having women among the gubernatorial class. He couldn't put a woman there as governor, but he started experimenting with women as deputy governors. We have uh, Elijah Latifa Okunu as one of the, I think there were two or three women who were made deputy governors, appointed. But I happened to be the first one elected under his administration. And it would, it would not have been allowed if he didn't have that vision that women should be given a chance. And that is when I came in touch with Her Excellency, Mariam Babangida. She was doing the Better Life for Women program. And she invited me to one of the of their functions as a woman who is in office, and I went there. That gave a lot of headache because Nigeria, as soon as you are in one place, some people believe you are trying to take over what belongs to them. Part of our problem, why we are not progressing. We have to give each other a chance to showcase ourselves. Everybody has a talent, and if we don't put it together, and make Nigeria a place that we all be proud of, we will continue to lag behind. So when Her Excellency invited me to be, you know, to uh, uh, grace the occasion, I went, and I met one of the most charming women I've ever met in my life. That is uh, uh, Her Excellency, Mrs. Mariam Babangida. And she accommodated me. She, she was very graceful and I could see why Baba was always, you know, at his best anytime he's with anybody. Better life for, uh, for, for rural women. At the grass le level, if it has been continued, what we are, the problems we are in now in Nigeria, we will not be in it. Because it, it reached, you know, to the lowest level of our people. And they, they have a sense of belonging, the way uh, she organized the better life for uh, rural women. Bringing them into uh, prominence, bringing them into focus, and many skills that you can do to support the homes. So I, I, from the point of uh, the women, President Babangida, is our hero. He is a man of the people. To me, if he had, you know, and I always say, God just gave him the uniform. You know, he uh, is actually a, 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 a Democrat at heart from the way he operated. And uh, when you look at America, most of the soldiers that became, I think, Eisenhower and uh, the, uh, the for American presidents that were soldiers before that you know they were the they, they were the foundation of democracy. They brought democracy into being, and I think that was the same thing President Babangida was trying to do for us. To you know the the gifts that he had as a military president to now bring it in as a democratic president, and nobody should grudge him that. Nobody should grudge him that. He, had the, he has the talents and he has what it takes to make this country to be one of the greatest countries in Nigeria. But unfortunately, you know, from the way we relate, which we have to change, we have to change, you know, blacklisting each other behind our backs. Babangida did not single-handedly annul the uh, MKO Abiola's presidency. People were behind it. And unfortunately, the box stops somewhere. The box stops at his table. I want to begin, I, I, I begin by premising my comments, because you asked a very, very pertinent question, by saying that we need 
to step back a little bit and take a more balanced look at the administration of, Professor ba uh, of uh, I I President Ibrahim Babangida. A lot has been said about his vision. But I think I want to introduce my own comments by saying that the uniqueness of that vision rested on a very, very bold set of policies that you are aimed at rebuilding Nigeria. That boldness, unfortunately, has also been one of the major weaknesses of his, of his, of, of his, of, of his policy reform, in the sense that the very boldness itself and the vigor with which it was pursued created contradictory forces in society that were determined to prevent those forces from coming to fruition. Because it, the reform was essentially directed at the way politics and society had been moving. So you cannot pursue that bold reform process without encountering very, very vigorous problems as well. I think it's important to mention that. And I mention it because, again, we have tended to discuss military rule in this country as if, as if uh, it, it will, it, it, there are not contradictory forces in society and in states that are in contention over the outcomes of the transition programs. You know, uh, in Latin America, scholars have shown how most transition processes are endangered ab initio because it involves a contest between those who want to move forward and those who want to regress. And I think we have looked at the IBB's presidency transition program without taking this very, very important fact into account. You know, the, the Brazilian political scientist says that you can hardly go through a transition process from military to democratic rule without disruptions, without landmines that involve, involve people getting killed, people getting you know, derailed, or even try, try being, getting derailed. So now, and I think that is the way I want to look at the major plank, the major political plank of his, uh, of the, of his administration's uh, transition program. And I'm doing so from the perspective that between 1987, under Emeawa, and 1992, when I left the NEC, uh, under, uh, under, uh, uh, under Philip uh, Nwosu, I was in charge, directly in charge of political parties. And I knew what was going on. And it is in that context that I want to raise certain issues about the, that particular aspect of the political transition program of Babangida. Because there have been so many false claims, so many misconceptions about how we manage that process. And I think it's important to say here that that old program of transition program that was, that, uh, that Sam referred to was built on, a, on solid intellectual foundations that were laid out by the political bureau. And I think it, it, it is the context of that. But what that intellectual approach also showed was that you can never be sure of the of consequences of applied public policy. For reasons that I said be, before, you are never in control of the, old, of the entire field. There are, there are unforeseen consequences, unforeseen details that you have to react against. And I think in that process, you know, you have to review and revise the program as you go along. Now, with that as a background, let me just briefly then raise a number of questions that I think most of those who have looked at this transition under IBB have tended to overlook or tended to underestimate. How did the two parties arise? 
the, the mainstream notion is that the, the, the military created these two, these two political parties. But we were involved under our at NEC, at NEC on how to create the two political parties. We laid out the guidelines and we recommended that none of the political parties had met the guidelines that were prescri prescribed. So the government was faced with the situation, what do we do in this context, given that the transition was going on. And that was where, and the, the, I think the uh, uh, Armed Forces Ruling Council met for a whole day, met for a whole day at the conference center, yeah, deciding on what to do to move ahead. And that was where in the context in which that was decided to have these two political parties. Based on some of the recommendations in our report, in terms of whatever parties are created, there must be some kind of an ideological balance, a little to the left and a little to the right. Now, I think the second point I want to make on that is, why did the transition between January 1992 and October 1992 virtually collapse? You know, people tend to say the military wanted to perpetuate themselves in power. The IBB did not want to stay as the president. Without looking at the social circumstances and the social forces at play. Now, I think the first major uh, detour that was taken between that, that period, uh, around the last quarter of 1991 and 1992, was the lifting of the ban on political party, on, 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 on certain categories of politicians. That was engineered from outside civil society itself. There were powerful forces, powerful forces that wanted the ban lifted. They wanted the ban lifted. And uh, again, this was a major problem confronting the AFRC in terms of what to do. Because important names like LK Jaconde, uh, Musa Yao, were also involved and they had political ambition. So I think the first detail that we have here was that measure, that, that measure in, I think, the last quarter of 1991, before the gubernatorial elections and, and state assembly, was to leave that ban. The second problem we had was, of course, the period leading from, Aug from August to Octo October 1992 with the presidential primaries. With the presidential primaries. Where all of these things contrived, you got people who were reacting to developments, and, and the politics of presidential succession became so important. This was, so, and I was <laughs> present in the middle of it all, when with the emergence of two leading candidates, those who were losing, more or less, came together and cried wolf. That this process has been violated. And, and when, they, when they, uh, they came before us in protest, why, why are you protesting? They then shifted away from concerns about the conduct of the elections, it's the primaries themselves, to saying that on this SDP side in particular, there was a, an undertaking that if the chairman of the party came from the north, then the presidential career of the party should come from the, from, the, so from the south. So that was why they deliberately set out to sabotage and make sure that that process did not end. And the mistake we made in, 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 in INEC that, and we discussed this without any, as to if we introduce primaries, should the primaries be done in one whole swap? or it is better to now face, stagger the primaries. And we thought that staggering the primaries will enable candidates to go around the country and for, for, uh, to, for, uh, to, to tell the people what their programs were. But unfortunately, once the first set of pr primaries started, then there was a gang up of those who were losing to discredit that process and make sure that it did not continue. And when we called them, that was exactly what, what they told us. And of course, then within society itself and within the military, there were those who were not comfortable with the two leading candidates, from what, from one from SD. So again, so within that whole section, there was a, an attempt to find some way of, of, of derailing it. And it was in that context <laughs> that INEC was asked to prepare a report and submit somehow or the other. The report presented before the, before the AFRC was contrary to what we had 
we had agreed as a, as a commission. So the one question then became, what are the forces at play to prevent this from going on? And it was in that context that I asked to move away from the commission, because I knew that there were certain forces at play that were not going in both within society and within the military that uh, in terms of protecting their own self-interest, that is not what needs to go on. Now, after that, the next set of problems came out from what do we do next? Primaries were cancelled, elections will not be held in December, and there was a question, what then do we do next? And then I think uh, our historians will have to answer a number of questions that, that, are, that, are, that I have. What happened between October 1992 and January 1993, when a transitional council was put in place. A transitional council made up of mainly people in the private sector. Why did the military itself not agree that if IBB was to step aside, somebody should come from within the military as head of state? And we, uh, we heard, we don't know how far it is true, that there were two leading candidates you know, from the South then agreement could not be reached about who should succeed. IBB with IBB setting apart. So the transition program was then adjusted to create what we might call a semi-presidential system of government. It, but I think it's important to make this final point. And, and that final point is that if there was, if there was in fact, ab initio, a plan to have an endless transition, or that the president did not to to, to step down. Did he engineer all these crises? Did, what, how can we explain those crises other than in just a psychologically reductionist way, uh, saying the man did not want to live or the man did not want to live? I think that is the task for historians and political scientists to, to look. To, what, what happened between the final quarter of 1991 and 1992 to derail the transition program in the way it did? And what, what I can gather from that brief intervention is that the, the complications that led to the final crisis of the transition was the product of politicking, both within the political class and within the military politicians. So, um, but I want to go away from uh, political issues to take on Elijah Madu Abaka, because one of the controversial areas of IBB regime was issue of financial management. You were, you were Minister of Finance towards the end. And of course, it's common knowledge that for most of the IBB period, oil never rose above $9. So much so that some of the landmark projects you see, including the conference center, had to be built through a better arrangement. It was only during the brief Gulf oil, I mean Gulf war, that um, there was a bit of uplift in oil prices. What, what was IBB's financial management method that enabled him to accomplish so much infrastructural change with so little oil income? Elijah Walker. Uh, I happened to be at the beginning of it. I observed that IBB came into government, into the leadership of this country, well prepared, well accumulated with its policies and focus, as composed by the three principles, the economy, the political, the social. The political was, the political I left into the narrative he explained, the social, I'll come into that later. We have the economic development. The issue is that, how did he achieve this? The man came into government in August. Three months later, we are more or less deregulated. Deregulated of the economy to the extent that we went into financial system deregulation, the political deregulation, the social, and also, indeed, the communication. That wouldn't have happened within the shortest time he was in government if he were not, he was not there prepared for it. 
How did he achieve this? First of all, I appointed the professional to take care of the situation of how to do it. How did they do it? They were given the freedom of coming forward with policy initiative. And he's a good listener to whatever you said. He believed in the teamwork. He believed in, living, in, in taking into consideration the services of the public officers. We went into it. We have when we went to the banking system for those who lived in the past for the past 40 years or 30 years here. We know what was happening in the banking system. We didn't relegate that system, and then the communication system. You have uh, people here, many newspapers, many transport. You go to the airport, what it was, and this. We went into that, and we did it. But particularly by March, the following year, we fully deregulated the economy. In the areas of financial system and public, uh, private sector involvement. Therefore, we have institutions, institutions, agency of the government, and leaving the private sector to handle the, 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 the areas where the private people can do better so that they have controlling system in the in those areas. But coming to the economy itself, it was such that the person lived, listened to his public officers, the professionals. I remember a case which he brought us to solve. We had a meeting with him, Ayekomo, and, and me with Central Bank. When he posed what to do, and I, I said, sir, it's not doable. He said to me, he said to us, it is our duty to propose problem. It is yours to solve the problem. Then he left. He left us with Oyokomo and others. And we were able to find a solution to it. Similarly, he was able to do it because he didn't bring any members of his family to play effective role in civil service at all. I came to know Mohammed few months or few weeks before we left the government in his office. That when he came to report that he had gone through his, his master's degree. Aisha at all, I didn't mean to leave the system. In other words, the public sector, the civil service in particular, they have the freedom. They have the freedom of running the government. Three is a good listener. Is a good listener. If you come to him, you say to him this, this, and that. Instead of saying to you, we are not going to do it, he will listen to you and look at the pros and cons of it and say, we go ahead. By that, he created confidence in his public officers, in his advisors. He created confidence in them to come to him, to advise appropriately, to do what they believe will help him, and to do what is right to do at, that, at the point in time. And up to date, that's what he does. I remember Chio Kongo. When we were together with Chio Kongo in the ministry, when he started, someone mentioned the case of uh, State House, the conference center, the secretariat, and so many, the military headquarters, the movement to, from Lagos to this place. When we started, if he had no characters, nobody could do that now. Particularly the issue of movement from the old system, financial system, into the new one, which agrees with the present economic system, will require a courage. Yes. 
So we moved along than that, and uh, we were able to do what we believed would help him because we believed he had confidence in us, because we believed he would allow us to do it. So if you go to the political side, you know, so the, the social system was the establishment of this institution that brought in the woman, the, the younger one, the people in the bush who could not have funds to run the business and so forth. And in the banking system, I remember we approved about 37 new banks within the period. Some of them are the major banks today. We deregulated, we, we moved out from banking system and left the private sector to deal with it. Otherwise, all the banks in Nigeria at that time, the Nigerian government had shares. They called it controlling shares. We were controlling shares. But we said, go ahead. But, pardon? So, in other words, he has his focus, he has the means to achieve the focus by getting the professional, he listens to his professionals, he agrees with them, and they move ahead. On his uh, management of a very complex economic situation, last and not the least, General uh, um I kept you <laughs> for, for a reason. The, re the reasons are obvious. One of them is that you became governor of a very difficult state uh, towards the end. But more importantly also, you happen to have fairly close relations with two complex military leaders. <laughs> <laughs> One of them was the mentor and boss of General Obangida. What was it like wearing so many caps? You had obviously two bosses to relate to. You had a political role, but you were first and foremost a military officer and you became governor of Lagos. I mean, governing Lagos is more complex than the rest of Nigeria. So can you share a bit of this experience? Uh, uh, th thank you very much. I, I think my own situation is not too different from the explanations of uh, my, my boss, General David Mack. Uh, it was on this last Saturday, I met with uh, Kazim in February at the wedding uh, ceremony in Lagos. And he asked me, are you coming for the dialogue? I said, which dialogue? He said, one on uh, IBB. I said, I've never been told anything of such. The following day, I got uh, the invitation. And I was told I was going to speak, or I belong to the panel that we talk on the economy during his reign as president of this country. I said, uh, uh, I think uh, I'm not that competent to talk about his economic policies because I was in the barracks throughout his time as president of Nigeria. I would rather who want to speak on how he built his regime, his nuclear and larger family to which I proudly belong. Uh, I came across the then Major Ibrahim Badamasi Babangida 50 years ago. Uh, that was when I came into the Nigerian Defense Academy. Uh, I was uh, 20 then during the short service uh, combatant course in 1971. And he happened to be my company commander. I think out of sheer divine uh, visitation, I happened to be one of the smallest in my, in my course, and he had some sort of affection for me. Now, I want to only pick one of his characteristics 
that has uh, planted love into so many families of extended family. That character is one that made uh, Kone Dangiwa Umar to say that is prepared to be blindfolded and going to war with the IBB. Um, it's large heartedness from my own experience and we want to share so that uh, the point can be driven home. As a lieutenant, I was commanding a squadron under him. He was, I was a lieutenant, he was a lieutenant colonel, commanding uh, a regiment in the Kaja. Then I was to go for a promotion exam, lieutenant to captain exam. And they called me and said, look, you have been nominated to go, go, go for an overseas course. You're going for that overseas course is dependent on whether you pass the exam or not. Then we, we I got prepared. They say, I told him in my usual manner that it's a matter of asking what position I'll be taking the exam. Failing it is, is not, is not is out of it. So we were to go for this exam and we normally take a uh, air warrant. Mixed up, I got to the airport. I was told that the plane had left for Joss. So I ran back to the regiment commander. I said, sir, uh, I don't see me making it to the exam venue, not to talk whether I will take it or pass or fail. He asked me what happened. I said, sir, the, the aircraft had left. I didn't, there was mixed up in the timing for the flight. So he called his driver and uh, filled his work ticket for his staff car. He said I should sit down in his office. I sat down and the driver came back, uh, signed the work ticket and said, it's all yours. I said, all mine, for what? That he should take me to, to Joe's. He was in uh, Keja Cantonment that time. He could have uh, asked the driver to drop him in his house, which is, by then, which was just about 10, at most 15 minutes walk. Yeah, I said, okay, sir, why don't you let uh, the car take you? He says, that one is none of my problem that I, I should go. He called the dispatch rider, a lieutenant colonel. The picture is still in my head. Remove his beret, hang it on his shoulder, and climb the uh, motorbike that took him home. Uh, that's one first uh, show of love that uh, beats uh, every imagination. Is he, he remain an unusual uh, leader? The second experience came during the time I was about to get married. I was, ah. a, I was a captain. So the normal tradition in the army was that uh, before you get married, you must tell your commander that, sir, I want to get married. And you have to introduce your will be wife gradually to the officer corps by bringing her to the mess, partaking in the officer's uh, uh, functions, and for us to gauge whether this is officer material or not. <laughs> so when I told him I was uh, trying to get married, he asked me, who is that unlucky girl? And I say, well, if she's unlucky, I'm lucky with you. She will get lucky at the end of the day. <laughs> that wasn't the problem. Myself and my wife, we decided that he was going to be the chairman of the reception. We told him. But I, I was too carried away, not following the, the culture and routine of getting married. And I, I was getting married to a, a very large, popular family. And that is the family of uh, late uh, Dr. Moses Majakodumi, the former civilian administrator of Western region, who had the then Lieutenant Muritala Mohammed as his ADC. So, when he told me that uh, I don't know what I'm doing, that uh, it is the duty of the 
lady's family to arrange reception and dress. I was annoyed. I went back to my boss. I said, sir, I think I will put off this marriage. He said, what happened? He said, I said, look, we have arranged that you are going to be, and my in-law is saying that uh, it can't be so. So he calmed me down. He said, look. In fact, he was accepting to do that for me because uh, th there's been restriction for the members of the uh, military council to limit the kind of engagement they go to. But he has an explanation that I was his cadet, I served under him as an officer. That is an excuse for him to be there. And he promised he will be there. And uh, I haven't discussed that. Again, he surprised me. He gave me his staff car, his driver, his orderly, that took me to the church with which I married my wife. Now, there was one thing that happened again. He came visiting as president to Enugu. And I was a battalion commander in Enugu at that time. Why the reception was going on in Oparasqua, he beckoned on me. I went to meet him. He asked me, do you know this uh, pepper fruit? I said, yes, I do. Go and get it for me. <laughs> Inside this uh, arena, I left and got uh, one of my senior officer's wife, because my family was not with me then, Cornell, the then Cornel Shaguta, this wife. I said, look, come, let's go to market. He said, what for? Pepper fruit. I didn't tell him uh, who wants to eat pepper, pepper fruit or not. <laughs> we, when we got, I washed it and put it in a bowl. Where he was seated at that reception, I walked with uh, a bowl of uh, pepper fruit. <laughs> As I opened it, he took one, put it in his mouth, and I took one too to show that, uh, well, uh, nothing is uh, wrong with this. <laughs> Then his usual abuse, you're a bloody idiot. If I know you are going to poison me, I won't send you. <laughs> and, and people were, were wondering, what the hell was Oyinlola eating with Mr. President? <laughs> now, the one that surprised me most. After the unfortunate incident of uh, Gigi Oka school. Many years after, one of the key participants came to me and said, I want to make up with the general. I said, uh -huh. okay. And I told my boss, look, one of your misguided boys said he wants to make up with you. He said, yes, bring him. He came to uh, his Abuja house and I took the officer to him. I'm not too sure many people will be able to stand that kind of thing from a man that level his foresight, his rifle foresight against him. And that was how he accepted and forgave, forgave the officer. Uh, he never, there's no time as small as I am that I extended my invitation to him that he was not honored. He has followed me to my village. One during my retirement as a governor of Washington State, and when I celebrated my 68th birthday. Well, uh, IBB has a subtle way of scolding you when you do not carry out your assignment well. I mean, your assignment, if you don't carry it out well. When he sees any fault, he will always advise you. Please, use that uncommon thing called common sense. And uh, when a guest annoyed, the only abuse I've ever heard from his mouth till tomorrow is to call you and say, you're a bloody idiot. That is uh, General IBB for you. When we got into office, uh, elected in the Third Republic, you know, there, is this, there was this Dyer Kiden. He was president under the military while the states were running as a demo, uh, democratic uh, formation. 
the relationships between governors and deputy governors have never really been that smooth. They are still working at it up till now. President Babangida had this um, unique way of stabilizing a very um, delicate situation. I happen to have been having a tough time with my governor then because of the way, you know, as a woman, the way I was received by the public, it was a new thing, a woman coming out, you know, and that created a lot, uh, some sort of uh, sensitivity, bordering on jealousy and people, you know, saying things that were not correct, like she wants to be the governor and she's acting like the governor. And that was a tense period, so much so that I had to take a special flight one day to come to Abuja to see Her Excellency, um, uh, Madam Maria Babangida, to let her know what was going on in my administration. Because it was the approach of uh, General Babangida, then President Babangida, that actually made this to have been happening as at that time. Because when we were not being treated right, the military had this decree 18 or something that said deputy governors listed almost 40 functions that deputy governors could perform, should perform under the military experiment. But, and that is why some of us decided to take on this um, appointment, this election, and go into the election, because we knew what we were going to do. But when the uh, democratic process started, they now introduced the constitution, which was called Decree 50 then. The Decree 50 now said, deputy governors will only do what the governors assigned them to do. You can imagine all the poor men, you know, and me, a woman that came on, on board to be deputy governors, only to be treated as a, um, spe they called it spare tires at that time. <laughs> and this didn't go well with many of us. So we approached President Babangida and said, this is what we I actually approached him and said, this is what, he said, go and convene a meeting of all the deputy governors, present your case, and we will look into it. If he was not women, you know, he is a military man, and um, I, I don't think uh, uh, General David Mack is uh, my, my late husband's uh, good friend. I haven't seen you in many years. God bless you. <laughs> And uh, uh, General Olagusoye, you know the military does not, uh, the democracy does not apply in the military. It's the go and come. For, for him, for him at that time to have said, we will look into it, go and hold a meeting, and let me have the outcome of that meeting. You know, put together all your grievances. We will look into it. And I wish that has been followed up. And the Constitution actually is, is made to show that at least some functions, statutory functions, deputies can do some stat Because many people have talents. They are lieutenants. But you should allow them also to be part of the, of the process without necessarily feeling that they are going to take over. President Babangida allowed that. And it gave me some... Breathing, uh, breathing space in Lagos State because they knew he had the listening ear, as everybody has said. He will listen to you, and he will not only listen to you, he will send somebody to actually follow up the situation and make sure that the right thing is done. That's a good quality of a leader, of a visionary person, of somebody who has foresight. And this is something I wish is happening in our present situation. We need it for this nation to move forward. 
we need to have a, 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 a physical, the physical presence of our, you know, our leaders. They need to be in touch with the people they are ruling. It's not a question of I'm there and you are there. It's a question of we are together. Government of the people, for the people, by the people. It's not talking on top of somebody and thinking that things will get done. I'm, 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 I'm appealing with this forum that people who are presently in office will look, you know, use whatever we come up with here because history, you know, it, it, it fades. We are now bringing it up. What made Babangida to succeed? Because Babangida's administration was a success. It was a success for this nation. Many things were done, and they were done successfully. Bringing people into limelight, the economy was not badly run, and Nigeria was making progress internationally. I pray that they will look into some of the uh, things we discuss in this panel to celebrate Baba's 80th birthday and use it to make Nigeria, to rebuild Nigeria and make Nigeria a better place for all of us. Thank you. Um, you did ask how I'm able to maneuver between two uh, Two, two senior officers who have had the opportunity of leading this country, one is senior to the other. The greatest time period for me in my life, in their relationship, when, when there was, when there was a conflict, I don't know how it was engineered. And it went to the pages of newspaper. One calling the other, uh, a fool as 70 is a fool forever, and the other one responding. Honestly, I was close to tears. I went to Baba Atota. I said, Sir, uh, in my place, they said, old dogs do not tear the mat. It is the small one that be trying their teeth on the mats. Why all this one? Hey, go and meet your guy. Because that's the way he tells me. That he started it. So I had to fly to, to Mina. Sir, what is happening? And I want to thank God that the two of them allowed me to meditate and settle that rift. So that's how I've been moving between them. I was saying that... Um this capacity and humility to learn, to want to learn. It used to be a lot of um, something that had always been with me over the years, including even, if, if you don't mind, including people like the distinguished senator, the longest seven Senate president we have in this country, that this crop of officers, I hope they are still there in the army, and the, and the military, who ordinarily didn't go to university in the former sense of it, other than their regular training. For people like IBB, my immediate boss then, late Admiral Ihomo, to have worked under or with people like Professor Boyade, Professor Zimiro and got to grips with the economics of structural adjustment program. Elements in which you no know, regular students will spend three or four years to get a PhD from. It's, it's, it's amazing. And that's something you cannot take away you know, from the man. I normally admire him on that. I wish he's able to do so. Maybe. Um, Alaji Mohammed and uh, Her Excellency Aisha, you are able to do, convince him because I had pressed and pressed for him to tell his own story by himself, not by other people telling the story. Many people, very brilliant works. Um, Dr. Shidi Amota is here, there are so many of them, Sir Moden and so on. 
But we need to hear him tell his story. But he's done around it, tried to help, but it didn't quite work. It is, it's amazing, this capacity. And that, for me, is the key for being what he is. May God continue to preserve and protect him, and we continue to remain as we are in Jesus' name. Let, let me uh, briefly, uh, I've, I've listened very, very carefully, and I just want to summarize in five or six key points. I think what I think uh, we should regard as the legacy of uh, IBB, and one that we should try as much as possible to embrace, even under the difficult times that we are going through now. The first one is, I think, empathy. And that has come out clearly, in, and I also experienced it. I had an accident in, in London in 1993. IBB called me, right? You know, I was still in the hospital bed. I said, Adele, how are you doing? And he asked a number of questions, which I only can tell my friends. <laughs> I can't tell them. <laughs> but I told him I was still a man. <laughs> the second one was when my mother died in 1992. You know, uh, he sent through a personal friend who was also close to him a message to the family, which we all appreciated. You know, but I think the lesson for us. And I was listening to uh, engineer Iwayawu. That empathy, I think, comes out of a sense of solidarity with the human being as a human being. We are going through difficult times now. When we draw lines of identity along ethnic lines, along religious lines, don't marry an Igbo girl. Don't marry a Yoruba husband. You know, don't marry a Christian. Don't marry Muslim. And you find families, more or less, refusing to attend their son's wedding because he's married to a Christian or a Muslim or a Yoruba son. I think the country, the way we are going now, if we are not careful, you know, that sense that, that lack of, 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 of oneness, of solidarity with, with our fellow human beings, no matter where they come from, may tear the country apart. There is so much hate speech going on now. And I think what we've learned from what everyone has said about IB today was that he was, if you want to use that word, detribalized. It was not that he, not that he did not have natal roots or, or natal cultural traits, but he saw what brings us all together. As, as a human, and I think it's very, very important. The second point I think is important to emphasize, and this comes out clearly, I think again in virus, is that intellectuals have an important role to play in transforming society. Despite the love-hate relationship that exists between intellectuals and policymakers, every, everywhere, but that you cannot do without the power of the intellect to find out what the solution, what the problems are, what causes them, and what needs to be done to find a solution to that. I think we live in an intellectual, anti-intellectual society. But I think IBB, above any other political leader in this country that I have studied, maybe to some extent, uh, the way it brought intellectuals around to formulate social policies in the West. I think IBB stands far much higher above the other political leaders we have had. And I think we can see that. We can see the movement away from that and the, the resurgence of anti-intellectualism in our society as a result of that. I think it's important that we continue, we go back to that tradition. The third point that I want to make is that let us realize that it is not easy to carry out bold programs of, of 
but of reform that are in the public interest. It is easy, I mean, uh, it, it is, it is, it, there are social costs to it. And I think IBB suffered for that because of the social costs of those policies and the range of enemies that rose to, both within and outside the country, that rose against those policies that he was trying to, to, to do. And we, are, we can still see that in terms of, you know, the, 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 the resistance to the upsurge of, in some very few areas, of, the, of, of, of withdrawal from the public space by uh, most, most of us today. The fourth point, I think, is the leadership style of, Professor I, 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 of uh, uh, President Babangida. The broad, cons, co, co, uh, the broad consultative process, even within the military, in reaching public policies. There are many times where, when I was in the Electoral Commission, under both under our and uh, on Fremosu, I attended meetings of the highest security in the country. And you could see the debate going on. The debate going on that you, are, could, could have, have seen, you could hardly even see in, uh, in, <laughs> in the Senate of a university. And everybody was able to speak. It, that it, there is no preconceived, uh, arranged, that you talk, and then you know whom you are going to talk, call to talk to, talk in favor of the position you stand as a vice chancellor. But it was a broad based a discussion that was going on, and all centered around the public interest and what, what we need to do to protect the public interest. The, uh, the last point I want to make goes back to my first point. We are passing through difficult times in this country. People are withdrawing. They are saying, look, we've given hope in the country. People are withdrawing. This is not the Nigeria we wanted. But I think the message, the message that, that IBB's administration, the relevance of its message for us was captured in that collection of essays that Sam referred to when he was speaking. Let us give our today for our children's tomorrow. Don't let us give up on it. We must speak out. We must speak out. People spoke out against IBB. They, 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 they condemned these policies. They spoke out, and he also learned lessons from that. Let us not withdraw to, our shell, to, to ourselves, saying that there is nothing we can do, and hoping that God, the country is so religious, that's how I was surprised that Sam was talking of religion. We take, we take risk because God's time will come. Let us wait for God's time. God will deliver us from him. But we must deliver ourselves, for us. We must deliver ourselves uh, on our own will. That is why it is important that for their tomorrow, we give our today, no matter at what cost. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, moderator. I, I want to congratulate the octogenarians and sectipenarians. Uh, uh, I, I know that there are a group of retired military officers called IBB boys. Now I know that there are also IBB civilian boys. <laughs> Because what I've heard today is exactly what, ex oh, oh, please, my, 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 <laughs> and girls. Okay, there are IBB girls now, and boys. But truly, I mean, in all honesty, he has got such a large heart that you can't fault him when it comes to kindness and empathy. I'm not aware of a single military officer who went to him and didn't get his request, not one. Even if he hasn't got, IBB is one person who will borrow money and give to another person. He's, he will go to that extent. And I think it's a personal touch in governance that has made him such a popular figure in this country. I'd like to congratulate the family and the children 
for this wonderful show of love to your dad and to your mom. Because he's not the only one who is kind to his children and kind to everybody. But to acknowledge it is another thing. And we have acknowledged it by bringing all of us together. I've not seen Larry Cunha for a very, very long time. And he hasn't changed at all, uh, seeing him now. So there are so many of us who have uh, come together today as a part of this celebration. I pray that the Almighty God will bless him and continue to give him long life. Thank you. Well, uh, just before I drop the mic, you know, Nigerians, we like to preach democracy, but we are dictators at heart. Uh, since I have this mic now, I don't know when I will have it again. <laughs> um, briefly, briefly, I, I want to share one or two moments that I had with President Babangida. Um, don't ask me in what role I have known and related to him for the last 35 years. Don't ask me, because I won't tell you. Now, I recall that when we founded the Guardian newspapers, I was in the founding team. Um, the first few weeks, he had come into office. And we had this tradition of publishing unusual photographs at weekends. We Nicely, out of, I mean, very innocently, we published a photograph of his second son, Aminu, was a little boy then, riding his bike, bicycle, on the lawns of, on the floors of um, the grounds of Dodan Barracks. He saw it. In a couple of hours, he called myself and a few of the leaders of the Guardian. And I was curious. And the message, after I compared notes with my colleagues, the message he had was, thank you very much for this photograph, but please leave the children out of it. You people focus on me, leave the children. They are not in office. And that sent a message across that early that here was a man who wasn't going to place his family uh, on the firing line, or wasn't going to make them co-presidents co of the country. And I took that lesson. On another occasion, I was with him uh, on a trip to a neighboring country. And when it was time to face the press, uh, because I used to be a journalist, I don't know if I'm still one now. I took my seat among the journalists. And he looked up and saw me. And he was like, Chidi, what are you doing there? You are either on that side or you are on this side. <laughs> I knew that he wanted me to change my seat. So I stood up and came to sit beside him. That was a message in loyalty. If you are loyal to him, let us stick where you belong. Don't go to the other side. Um, on another occasion, people got worried, more worried than myself, that I wasn't occupying some fancy position. So I had gone to see him for a different reason. And he said, oh, by the way, somebody just left here now. And guess what they brought? I said, what is that? He said, they brought your CV. So I opened my eyes and said, you know, some people love you more than yourself. But, and then he said to me, I want you around me so many years after I've left office. And I'm happy to say today that 30 years after he stopped being president, there's one title that he never shared he still regards me as a friend. So um, I, I want to congratulate Aisha and the rest of the, her siblings on this very courageous uh, occasion. And I'm hoping that they will institutionalize the IBB dialogue to become an annual event 
where you can have this kind of dialogue, have a lecture, and, and so on. Because the amount of work he has he put in, in the nation building, is not something that should be frittered away or to be forgotten. So once again, I want to thank everybody on the panel and the rest of us for honoring this invitation. Thank you.